Which is the same thing as the same stuff because they are perfect. Yeah, so let's continue with the last talk of this afternoon. Was that we need to introduce you to Maria Media Salata who talk about growth of common gate quality or it's about the price. Um, um, so first of all, uh, I'm very happy to be here to give, to give this talk, and I also want to to thank the organizers for the help and support. So okay, so this will be an upcoming collaboration with Eckhart that I hope will be ready soon. Um, so let me start by the by the motivation. So characteristic classes. So there are all these nice descriptions of characteristic classes for algebraids, like um, Evans, Lou, and Weinstein. They define some characteristic classes for representations of line bundles, online bundles. And then Marius and Rui, they have some definition of characteristic classes for algebraids associated to representations. Um, when I started to look at these constructions and definitions, there were some things that let me wonder about like what was going on or if there was some basic explanation of these constructions and why did they work? Why did they define some cohomological classes? So let me remind, remind you what... Uh, Marius did in one of his papers, he constructed some characteristic classes for representations of algebraids. So you start with that representation E, okay? And then what you can do is the following. So you fix a frame of E, and then when you take a section of A, the connection that defines the representation you can write it down in terms of, of this frame in this way, okay? So here, this one, this is, this will be a, 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 a matrix, right? A matrix. And uh, of course, this matrix will depend on the section side, okay? So at the end, what I will have is an element of this space. So to each section side, right? I will get a matrix. Okay, so what happened is that this, this element here will induce a map from the chevalier eilenberg complex of GLN to the chevalier eilenberg complex of the algebra A, but when you pull it back to the frame bundle. So I have this map here. And what Marius does is that he says, okay, so I can look at the elements that I, uh, that I uh, uh, like the UN uh, basic subcomplex of, of the child like Ellenberg complex of GLN, right? And when I do that, these factors through this, through this uh, complex, which is again the Chevalier Eilenberg complex of the algebra, but, but, but now when I pull it back here, like to like here on the question of, of the frame bundle with UN. Okay. And when I do that, what happens is that the fibers of this bundle, they are contractible. So by a result of Marius, this is this map, this. Uh, this map going from the complex of A to the uh, complex of the pullback is a homotopy equivalent. Okay, so meaning that after you pass to cohomology, the cohomology the cohomology will be the same. So at the cohomology cohomological level, I can invert this map. What bothered me was that 
I really didn't have like a, a map right away at the cochain level going from this space to this one. It was just after passing to cohomology. Okay. So th that's why I said that like it goes in the in a bad direction because I really wanted to have something written down at the coaching level. So in my like in my effort to understand these these things, what I did was to okay let's try to to come up with a definition for groupoids and see if I can understand better things there. And actually, there, there was a very simple definition for characteristic classes for like associated to representations of a, a legal point. So what you do is the following. You start with the legal point G. Then you look at the representation, right? So this is encoded in a legal point morphism from G to GLE, which are these are uh, linear isomorphisms between the fibers of it, right? So this map will induce a pullback on the complexes. So don't worry if you don't understand some of the notation because I will come back to, the, to define these complexes. So don't worry. Uh, so, okay, so, so I have this map here. And on the other hand, because this space GLE, GLE is transitive, and a result by Marius tells me that the isotropy groups are Morita equivalent to this group point. Okay? And when you have this Morita equivalence, the, the map that, the, that, the, that the is induced by this inclusion at the cohomological level is a, a homotopy equivalent, okay? So by the way, the isotropy groups are isomorphic to GLA, okay? So what, what I get here is, okay, so I have this homotopy equivalence, meaning that after I pass to cohomology, this is an isomorphism, so I can invert it after I pass to cohomology, and then the characteristic classes will be just the images of the generators of this cohomology. But once again, I didn't like that this map was going in the wrong direction. Okay, so okay, so I, I started to wonder like, is there like a bi basic explanation or construction? for these characteristic classes, like how can I invert these maps, right? The maps that I didn't like that were going in the wrong direction. And what is the appropriate setting to deal with these characteristic classes or these cohomologies? So now we can forget about the, <laughs> about the motivation. And I will tell you about this setting that I found very useful and basic and somehow was giving me all the explanation. And let me start first by explaining the groupoid set. Okay, so this is relative cohomology for groupoids. Okay, so you start with a groupoid G over M, and now you can you consider a Y subgroupoid, meaning that it's a subgroupoid over the same base M. So just to fix some notation, now we have this space, BP of G, which is the set of P composable arrows of G. And so the, the differential cohomology of G of my little point is defined by this complex. So these are just maps of these spaces of composable arrows. And here the differential is just some simplicial differential. Okay, now <clears throat> what what happened is that I have actions of G on this space. These are P plus one commuting actions. And uh, well, the anchor is the, the source of the E component of the E arrow, okay? Anyway, so the, the actions are defined in this way. So I have here equal to zero between one and P and four P. 
Okay, so what is relative homology or the homology of, of G relative to the subgroupoid K? What I can do is that I can restrict this action to K and I can consider this space, which are the co-chains of, of G, right? Elements of this space, functions, so that these functions are invariant with respect to all the um, all the uh, K actions on this space, okay? One can check that this is a subcomplex, it's not very difficult to check, and then the definition is that the cohomology of G relative to K is the cohomology of this subcomplex. Okay, so let me look at some interesting example, which is the transitive case. So let's think that you have that, that K, your subgroupoid is transitive, okay? So to any two points of M, I will have an arrow connecting them, an arrow inside of K. And remember, I mean, because K is transitive, G will be, will be transitive. So by this, by, by transitivity, I know that this, the cohomology that computes this complex is the same as the cohomology that computes this one, right? And the relation is given by this restriction map. The problem that I had was that I didn't have a map from this space to this one, okay? But just looking at relative cohomology, you gain this map. So when you go relative, you have this way of going back, okay? Here, so here uh, G of C is the, uh, the isotropic group, right? So the inverse of the um, T, T minus one of, C, of Z intersected S minus one of Z, and K of Z is the isotropic group of, of K. And this extension map, is defined uh, very easily. What you do is the following. So you take a function here, right? So um, you have now to evaluate it in P composable, composable arrows of G. What you do is, okay, you, ha you, have my, you have the fixed point Z, and then because K is transitive, you can uh, join Z with all these endpoints by elements of K. Okay, you join them by elements of K, you choose that, and then you define uh, the extension at this element by this formula. Look that, for example, this one. This one will be an element of my isotropy because you do this one, then here, and then you come back. So you are really on your isotropy group, okay? The fact that this extension map doesn't depend on the choices is because my map, my, my function f was uh, invariant. Okay? And the theory, which is very easy to prove, is that, well, that uh, the, the complex, the relative complex of my isotropy groups is isomorphic to this other complex, right? of the relative uh, uh, complex of G, and the isomorphism are given by these extensions and restrictions. So they are really uh, isomorphisms in, and inverse to each other on the nose. Okay, so now I will come back to this case, but uh, after, after a minute. So let me tell you what happened with the algebraids. Okay, so let's now start with Ali algebra A over M. And so just to remind you, well, this is the Chevalet Ellenberg complex of my algebra. These are sections of the wedge of A star, right? And in this, like here, I have a Cartan calculus. So a section of A will give me two operators of this complex. One is given by contraction, user contraction. 
And the other one is given by the derivative. And the lead derivative is defined by the differential of, of this complex, uh, the commutator of the differential with the contraction. Okay. Now, what happened is that when you have a least subalgebroid B, then I can consider these horizontal subspace, which are the sections of, um, um, of my complex, which are killed by, section, by, by elements of B. Okay? This is, not, this is canonically isomorphic to sections of this space, of the quotient, of the dual of this quotient, right? Because are killed by B. Okay. And what happened is that when I look at this space, right? When the, and I'm identifying this space with this space of sections, I see that actually here, I have a representation of B. And the representation of B is actually given by these lead derivatives. Okay, so if I take a section of B and I consider this lead derivative and I restrict it to the two space, this is actually coming from a representation of B. Okay, another way to think about this representation is that you have the quotient of A mod B, right? And here you have the both representation of B, which is given by the Lie bracket mode B. And this representation, when I take duals and wedge, will induce this one here. Okay. So now what I can do is I have, uh, I can define the basic uh, space, which will be the horizontal part, right? This one here intersected the invariant part, which are just sections so that L psi of alpha is zero for all psi a section of B. Okay. So the cohomology now of A relative to the subgroupoid is given by, so the, the first part is that you have to prove this lemma, that this is a subcomplex, this is a subcomplex of the Cheva Lake Eilenberg complex of A, but this is kind of easy. This, this follows by the Cartan calculus that I have here, okay? And now I can define the cohomology of A relative to B as the cohomology of this subcomplex. Okay, <clears throat> now when you go to the integrable case, so when your algebraic comes from a little point, you have a very nice interpretation of the, all this calculus. So first of all, uh, let's recall that the algebraic will be just the kernel of the differential of the target restricted to the units, okay? And when I do that, I can identify, and actually this is how you define the Lie algebra of a, of a Lie point. I can identify the space of sections of A with left invariant vector fields of G tangent to the, to the, uh, uh, to the T fibers, to the target fibers, okay? And the identification is that, okay, you map psi to this left invariant vector, vector field. Here is left, multipl left multiplication. When you do that, then uh, this space is identified with differential forms on G, which are foliated, okay, foliated by the target, and which are left invariant. And when you do that, then you can interpret the differential of A as the, the RAM differential. The contractions by sections of A are, is it, is it working well? The contractions with, the, with sections of A with the usual contractions of left, left invariant vector fields and the lead derivatives also with the usual lead derivatives of uh, left invariant vector fields. Okay, so this is kind of uh, well known. 
what is kind of cute is that uh, when you consider the group of bisections of G, okay, so this is, uh, so these are maps, smooth maps from M to G, such that they are sections of the target. And when you compose with the sources a diffeomorphism, this is a group, you can endow it with a, with a multi multiplication. Then this group acts on this space or this space in the same way as a Lie group acts on the dual of its Lie algebra using like the quadjoin action. Okay, so what you do is as, as follows. So a section of G, think of a Lie group. If you take a, a if you take a bisection of a Lie group, it's just a point. So a bisection of my Lie group boy will induce a conjugation on my Lie algebraic. Okay, given by this formula. And conjugation by bisections, they are actually automorphisms of my Lie group boys. They respect all the, all the uh, structure of my Lie group boys. Then you can define the action of this bisection on an element, element oops, alpha just by doing the pullback. Okay? Or on this side, if I have a left invariant vector field, I can also pull it back, okay? If you look at the case of Lie groups, what I'm doing is actually the adjoint, the quadjoint action. I'm not doing anything different, okay? And, but why do I do that? Because here I have this, these corollaries are kind of immediate. For example, the action will commute with the differential of my algebraic just because I can interpret the differential of my algebra as the, the ram differential, and I know that pullbacks commute with the ram differential. Okay, so this follows easily. And here also follows kind of easy is that if I take um, the, infinitesim the infinitesimal action, is actually the infinitesimal action of this adjoint uh, or coadjoint action is actually these Lie derivatives, okay? So this is the, the, this part here. Here, this bisection, this one that I brought here, is just the flow of the left invariant vector field induced by psi restricted to the units. Okay, so, Okay, now let's think that you have your sub subgroupoid, K. Now I can look at, the, at this action, but now not like not looking at the whole set of bisections of G, but just the ones that, I, that come from, from K, right? So this in principle, in principle was acting here, but when I, act only on this U space, it actually, this U space will be a subrepresentation. It's like, you can easily show that. Why? <laughs> because I mean, if you take a bisection of K and you conjugate by a bisection of K, of course, this will send your, your uh, the differential of, of this conjugation will send the algebra of K to itself, okay? And remember that here, I was interpreting this horizontal through space at this quotient, right? So it will send B to B, so it will induce a map on the quotient. Okay. And this, uh, uh, this action actually comes from a representation of K, from an actual representation of K, which integrates the representation that I told you about of B on this space, the one that coming from the both representation. Okay, this also followed by this corollary somehow. So I can look at the K basic subcomplex, which is just the sections of the horizontal subspace, which are invariant with respect to the action of, of K. One can check 
also by this corollary, but by this very basic interpretation that this is a subcomplex of the basic of the B basic subcomplex of, of A. Remember that here B was the algebraic of K. Okay. Um, so let's look at the transitive case. Okay, so now I'm thinking that the Lie algebraid, uh, algebraid B is transitive, meaning that when I look at the uh, image of the anchor, this is sur uh, surjective, it's the whole TM. Okay, so in this case, I have this sequence, right? So this projects to TM, the kernel, I will denote it by H, the, the, the kernel of the anchor of B, right? And of course, you have uh, this sequence somehow sits inside this other sequence. This is the anchor of the, the kernel of the anchor of A. And when I look at the quotients like uh, TM mod TM, this is zero, then B mod A will be isomorphic to H mod G. Okay, so this is, a can this is somehow canonical, this isomorphism when I'm in the transitive case. Okay, so in this case, you can see that K as before also acts on this quotient as it was acting on, on the quotient of A mod B in the same way. And then I can look, I can identify canonically this complex with this one here. So this one I didn't define it, but it's just, so this one here is the, it's elements of the complex of G such that when I do contractions with elements of H, it's zero and are invariant with respect to the action. Okay. Okay. And you see that in this case, we, as in the group voice case, we also had that the inclusion of the isotropy Lie algebras. So what are the isotropy Lie algebras? Okay, so this will be like G of Z will be the fiber of this one and H of C will be the fiber of this one, but they are also the Lie algebras of the isotropy Lie groups. Okay, so here I have this, this identification. And you see that the inclusion of G of Z on G will give me a restriction map going from this space to this one. So I have it for free, but you cannot go back in general, okay? But as soon as you go relative, you can do that. So if you consider things that are relative or, or, or uh, basic, uh, as I denoted here, then you can go in this direction. And the formula is very, like, uh, is very easy. I mean, you take alpha will be a map here. And what you do is, okay, now I need to define something here. Okay, so I choose a point M on M and the map here is just, okay, so alpha is based at Z, but I can act by an element of K to join Z with M, okay? And when I join them, I can act here and this will be I, this will produce an element on the target. So here at M. Okay, and this definition doesn't depend on the choice of this arrow of K, just because I'm taking things that are 
uh, that are K as basic. So they are invariant with respect to the action of K. Okay, so I have the result that these two complexes are isomorphic and they are isomorphic via the extension map and the inverse is just the restriction. So this is kind of nice because, I mean, you can compute like the, the cohomology of a Lie algebraoid in terms of the cohomology of Lie algebras. So the, the transitive case is doing that. You, you have this huge like Lie algebraoid and then you compute everything in terms of the, of the isotropies, which is kind of like a, a standard or classic. And, and you can do it at the, at the co-chain level which was something that it that there there was not something like like this before i mean you knew that these things were equivalent but if you really wanted to compute at the coaching level well you had to make some choices or trivialize or do things like that okay so <clears throat> what about vanest So, so this one is map was uh, first like for the for groupoids. Uh, groupoids was first assigned by Weinstein and Shu, and then Marius like wrote a, a paper about this Vanes maps. It relates the differentiable cohomology of my groupoid with the Chevalier Eilenberg cohomology of the al algebra. It's very explicit. Okay. And like also with uh, with Yonuts and and Alejandro and then with Eckhart and Eckhart with Leblanc, uh, like we also in some cases kind of found uh, inverses, like right inverses at the coaching level, very explicit in some cases. Okay. The the, the, the first coloralist that you have here is that. When you look at the, so when you fix a subgroupoid K, a white subgroupoid, and you look at the, uh, at the, at the Lie algebraoids, then the first thing is that, well, Van Est restricts to the relative complexes. Okay. This is kind of, well, it's a computation, but it's something that you expect. And the second thing is that when you are in the transitive case, okay, so when you are in the transitive case, on the one hand, you have this vanest for the ligroupoids, right? And on the other hand, you will have vanest for the Lie groups, for the isotropy Lie groups, right? And you have these extension maps. So the second thing is that this, this uh, square commutes. Okay, so this is something that is expected. Let me tell you about the proper case. So the proper case is kind of interesting. So now consider, think that you, you have your subgroupoid K, which is proper. Now think that it's proper. As soon as you have a, a, something that is proper, you know that you have left invariant normalized hard systems. What is that? So this is like a, a way to, these are measures on each of the T fibers. So it's a way to integrate over, over each T fiber in a smooth way, okay? Also less it invariance, it has many properties. But uh, so this was a study also by Marius and by Joao, these, these normalized hard systems. Okay, so when I have that, I can take averaging Okay, so for example, here I can consider the, the one of these actions of K on these spaces, and I can take the averaging with respect to these actions. This is this kind of formula, right? Here I'm averaging with respect to A, right? And what happened is that if I consider the composition of, this, of all these averagings, 
then I can go from the differentiable cohomology of G to the relative cohomology of G. So as soon as you average with respect to all these actions, of course, the, 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 what you produce is something that will be invariant with respect to the actions, okay? And this map is a co-chain map. Okay, so here I have the averaging. I have the useful one S. So I can, these are, these are two like co-chain maps, right? So I can take the composition. And this, I denoted like this, van S of G mod K, okay? <clears throat> and then I have two, two results. But let me tell you something about the hypothesis of this theorem before I explain the, the, the results. So this has to do with the notion of maximally compact, okay? So, which is a notion that is given for Lie groups, but is not like we haven't studied yet. As long I, I don't know if somebody has studied it, but as long as I know, nobody has studied like maximally compact what it means, what it implies. So <clears throat> this thing here means that if I take the quotient, so I take something that is proper, k is proper, and I can take this quotient here, the left cosets. Okay. This condition tells me that this space is isomorphic to this vector, vector space, to this quotient, okay? In a way that the isomorphism will respect the fibers of this vector space and the induced T fibers of this one. So somehow what you, what you are doing, so this has several like consequences, First of all, each of the T fibers of this space will be contractible because they are isomorphic to vector spaces, right? And second of all, this will induce, this diffeomorphism will induce a multiplication on each of the T fibers, okay? Actually, when you look at this no notion for Lie groups, this is equivalent to a fact that K, K proper, proper in the Lie group case means compact, but this will be equivalent to the fact that K is maximally compact, okay? Maximally compact, meaning that it's compact and, and that if I have any other subgroup which is compact and contains K, it must be K, okay? Of course, I mean, these equivalence for Lie groups has a lot of Lie theory. So you don't expect that the same ho would hold for Lie group points. I mean, it has a lot of, a lot of, I tried to went through the, through the proof and it has a lot of Lie theory. So I, I think there is a lot to study there if you, if you want to come up with a definition of maximally compact and see what is, are the equivalence or what this implies, okay? So, <clears throat> So, okay, so the first, the first part tells me that if I have this condition, then this map here is a homotopy equivalence, okay? And actually this map will induce a right inverse at the co-chain level, okay? So I will have here R. Now, the second condition is stronger, okay? The second condition is telling me that G is isomorphic to this fiber product. And this isomorphism is very special, is given by multiplication, okay? I multiply things from, coming from here with the elements of K. And I am assuming that this is K equivariant. Here, K is acting on this space, on N mod B, okay? And here is acting by left multiplication on G. If you look at the case of Lie groups, then this holds for K, which are maximally compact 
and G se semi-simple. Okay? Of course, here, if you want to try to, <laughs> to, to, to study this type of, of diffeomorphisms, you will have to go through the theory of semi-simplicity for leading points. And as far as I know, well, there, we haven't studied yet like completely. So there is a lot to, to study there. Okay, so what happened is that if I have this type of uh, isomorphism, then an analogous result will hold, but now for this space, for this map. So this vanest in this side will be an isomor and, and homotopy equivalence, and the right inverse, I can produce it at this level. Okay, so I have uh, 20 minutes. So maybe if I have time, I will tell you a bit out the proof. Also something that uh, I wanted to, before going to the, to the next topic, uh, this was something that we proved together with Eckhart in the case of Lee groups and our, so the first part, okay. And our hypothesis was that K was maximally compact, which as I explained here, is equivalent to being uh, to G mod K being deformed to, to the quotient of the Lie algebras. Okay, so I may come back to the, to the proof, but let me tell you how all this applies to like computing characteristic classes. Okay, so you start with a representation of G and think that it's a complex representation that has rank N. Okay, so a representation is a map from G to this Lie, Lie groupoid that I mentioned before. These are linear isomorphisms of the fibers. Okay, so this will produce this map here. Now, if I, if I fix a Hermitian metric, I can consider this subgroupoid of this one, which are the uh, linear isomorphisms, which are compatible with the metric, okay? So they commute with the, with the metric. This is transitive, this is a transitive uh, subgroupoid and it's actually proper, but this is something that actually I don't use, but this is transitive. Now, if you look at the isotropies of this groupoid and this least subgroupoid, so the isotropy of this space, you can identify it with GLN. Okay, so these are linear isomorphisms of one of the fibers. And the isotropy of this one, which are linear isomorphisms of one of the fibers with that respects the metric, is of course uh, uh, isomorphic to a unitary group, okay, which is actually uh, maximally compact inside of GLA. Okay, so what I have is that after I fix these isomorphisms, then I can look at the relative cohomology of the isotropy relative to, in this case, to UN, right? Now I can look at the extension. So you go to the relative cohomology of GLE relative to this GLE H. Then I can include it here, the natural inclusion. And here I already had the the isomorphism coming from the, 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 the map from in, coming from the representation. So the characteristic classes will be just the images of the generators of this cohomology. Okay, which is kind of what I wanted to do at the very beginning, right? I had, I had like something going, going here and then going here, but I didn't know how to go this way. Now I can. Okay, 
when you look at the case of Lee algebroids, I will actually recover the definition that Marius gave in his paper, but I do it in a different way, which is okay. Now you have a representation of your Lee algebroid, which is a map from A to this Lee uh, mm -hmm. algebroid, just this definition, okay? So these are operators of E, which are linear and satisfy this condition. And the isotropy of this Lie algebraic is just GLN, the all matrices of rank N, okay? So <clears throat> by, my, by the theory that I was explaining, I can go from the relative complex of the isotropy Lie algebras to the relative complex of the algebraids by this extension map, which is an isomorphism, then I can just include it here, right? And this was the map from coming from the representation. So this definition recovers the, the, the definition that, Mary, that Marius has in his paper, okay? Um, of course, all these constructions are related by Van Est. So you have these diagrams that commute. And also in this side, you have an integration map, this R. And here, going from here to here, what I will do is to use the polar decomposition of GLN. Remember that, so just... In this, in this, um, look that um, here I will actually use the second part of the theorem. I mean, I'm assuming that you have this diffeomorphism, right? And as soon as you have this diffeomorphism, then I can produce a right inverse going from the Lie algebra to the Lie group points. Here I'm going to the Lie algebra to the Lie group. Uh, why? Because I will the polar decomposition will give me a diffeomorphism in this way. I will show you. Okay, so how you compute the characteristic classes? I think this part I read it in a book. I don't remember where, maybe Gishar Ted, but I, I think like you can check in many of many books. So what you do is the following. So you have so, some, you have like, you use the polar decomposition of GLN. So you write GLN as, as the sum of UN, right? These are matrices that satisfy this condition with positive definite Hermitian metrics, which are matrices that satisfy that A star is equal to A. Okay, this is called the polar decomposition. And then the generators of this cohomology are given by these co-chains. Okay, they live in these degrees. And what they do is, of course, these, these maps will go from, let's say here, M, depending on the, on the grading, to R, okay? So what you, what you do here is that you take two Q plus one matrices B and, and what you do is here is some uh, I to some power because sometimes you get something that is complex. But what you do is that you take traces of the Hermitian part, of the product of the Hermitian part. Okay, this gives me at the cochain level, the generators of this cohomology. It's quite simple, it's given by traces. And actually if you compute like uh, characteristic classes, many times they are given by traces, okay? Now, what happened is that at the level of GLM of the Lie group, you also have a polar decomposition. 
okay? The composition is this one. So you take P, this is positive definitive Hermitian, Hermitian matrix. You, have, you take the unitary group and then any matrix, invertible matrix, you can write it as the product of a matrix of UN and the exponential of a Hermitian, positive definite Hermitian matrix. Okay, this is called the polar decomposition. It's unique, this decomposition, and gives me an isomorphism. Okay, and it's actually UN equivariant, this, this isomorphism. Okay, so I, I will not tell you how you compute in general this, this R of U, but I can tell you that the first uh, uh, the first class, the first co-chain, is given by, okay, you take a matrix, and what it gives you is the trace of the Hermitian part. Okay? So, for example, this um, if you take, for example, uh, uh, the trivial, uh, trivial, like a, a trivial, the trivial line bundle over G, right? And you look at representations on this line bundle and you compute the characteristic classes, which is just one because it's one dimensional, you will recover kind of the representation. So what you do is as follows. So remember these characteristic classes, I defined it for complex, for complex vector bundles, but what I can do is, okay, I take my representation, I just complexify, right? Here, remember that I chose a Hermitian metric, you can choose the standard Hermitian metric, and then you define this map of G, which is, okay, the representation of the trivial line bundle is given just by looking at how it acts on one, right? So this produces a map on G. Okay, now you can define this R of G. This will be a function. It will be the logarithm of the absolute value of this phi. Okay, and the first characteristic class of this representation is just this R. So actually you are kind of encoding the representation. When you look at representations of the algebra just in, in this case, in this very simple case, you do the same, right? So the representation is encoded in how, how uh, elements of A, sections of A act on, on the section, on the trivial section one, on the, yes, tri trivial section one. So what you do is, so out of a section of A, this will produce a function on M, which is, okay, you act on this section, on, on, on one, right? You add by with side, you act on one, and this produces this map. And then the first characteristic class of my algebra is just this function theta of psi. Or, or V1 B, B evaluating on size theta of psi. And like this, you recover the modular class, for example, of Evans, Lu, and Weinstein, the ones that they define for line bundles. They defined it for algebraids, okay? Uh, but they have some comments about the Ligrupoid case. And you can, and in particular, you recover the representation of this line bundle, which is kind of well studied for Poisson manifolds. This is, this is the so-called modular class of a Poisson manifold, the, the one that it's, uh, you, you take this representation and then you look at, the, at, the, at this class. Okay, so to finish, because I think the proof is kind of long, I, I won't go into that, is of course, I mean, it would be nice to compute characteristic classes for other geometric uh, objects like com contact or symplectic groupoids, okay? And foliations and so on, and actually compute them. I mean, there are very, like these formulas are very explicit. So you can really 
compute them. And then, as I mentioned, like this, if you start to if you start to say like Vaness, and when Vaness holds, you get into the notion of maximally proper for group voids, right? But then you can, if you start, <laughs> I mean, there are many questions if you go into lead theory for, for, for group voids, like what this notion would imply or semi-simplicity, for example, for group voids or for algebraids. And that's all, thank you. Other questions? Oh, my. Thank you. Um, so I was a little bit curious. So probably it's on purpose that you didn't show us uh, those R's of other U's. What about R of U2? Yes, I, I tried to compute. I think you can compute it, but it's, it's difficult. So- well, um, Roughly speaking, what just in two words, what's the like, what will be the difficulty or what will be the computation? Um, um, I can tell you how you could do it. I mean, you already have like very explicit formulas for the Lie, al for the Lie algebra, right? Yes. So you just need kind of to move it to the group side. What happened is that- um, but, but is it, but I thought, Going from the algebra to the group, you also make choices, right? Of co boundaries. It, it's not unique. What about? It's that? not a unique, but as soon as I fix the polar decomposition, is unique because this this right inverse. I I, I think I maybe I, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but the right inverse you produce it out of this uh, of this deformorphism. Okay. So as soon as you have here, here I have my compact Lie group, right? And here I have, um, well, in this case, P. So, so in general, it would oh, be like- I can make the question more precise. You're saying it's unique. It's Once, unique. When you fix- it, it satisfies what condition which makes it unique? No, no, I mean, you, you could have many drive inverses. It will depend, they depend only on this diffeomorphism. But this, if, if, I mean, if I find another diffeomorphism, then the right no, inverse will good. change. You, you chose this one. So what's then, then the co-cycle is unique with some property. The co-cycle is unique, yes. With some property. Well. What's the property? It's invariant, it's UN invariant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I don't know if I answer you. No. Can you okay. reformulate no. the question? Yeah. I mean, if you have another decomposition, not the polar decomposition, you will produce different co chains. Are there other, other questions? There's one just up there, Mario. Uh, Maria. Hi, Maria. Thank you for the thank you for the nice talk. Um, so I have a conceptual question. So for these characteristic classes, you should have. I mean, it should have some topological meaning, right? Yes, I mean, it should not just be, I mean, otherwise, it should not just be R coefficient, it should be Z coefficient. How, how do you interpret this? I haven't thought of like a Z coefficient. Right. So instead of, yeah, I haven't thought about, I mean, for instance, if you have that the representation, but this is something that it, that also was studied before. If you have a representation which is compatible with some Hermitian metric, then the characteristic classes are zero. For example, um, so usually in different, so so I thought that's something very very uh, what you do is very good, right? Because uh, 
I, I guess I wouldn't also know in, if, if it's just the algebraic what to do, but then you you also have the counterpart on the group white, may, maybe some sort of a check, check cycle in that direction will bring, bring you some yeah. coefficients. I think that, so, I mean, I, I, I look just at the very basic things because, but I, this is something that I, I really want to study like more in detail and also for some geometric structures, what's really the meaning. Thank you. Are there some other questions? So something else, like when you have, uh, when you are in the semi-simple case, the, the polar the, the composition is very, like it has the properties of a Cartan decomposition of a semi-simple Lie group, okay? And when you have this Cartan decomposition, you can use it to integrate co-chains. I mean, and I think these decompositions are kind of unique. I mean, if you, they have some properties and then, right? So they, these are these decompositions and then you will produce something that is, that is uh, um, K-basic somehow. They, these decompositions are equivariant, like at U, in this case, UN equivariant. And in general, will be like K equivariant. Okay. Some other questions? If not, let's thank Maria again. And then small announcement. So now we have the buses that go back. Uh, I think they should leave in 15 minutes. Well, we, we won't let anyone, anyone behind. Uh, no, it's not clear. <laughs> it's not clear. Uh, and then tomorrow, I, I remind you that we'll be in another room. So we won't be here at Ithamat, but we'll be in the city center uh, at Zetik, right next to the Residencia de, de Estudiantes. So see you all there tomorrow. <laughs>